I'm KVU senior reporter Tony Plahetsky. Thank you for joining us. Today was the first day of testimony in the murder trial against Caitlin Armstrong and the death of acclaimed cyclist Mariah Wilson. During opening statements, we heard evidence for the first time from both the state and the defense, including how they plan to defend Caitlin Armstrong against those murder charges against her. I want to introduce two attorneys to you that we invited to help us unpack the lengthy opening statements by both sides today. We have Thomas Just, who is an attorney here in Austin specializing in defense work, as well as James Wood, who is a familiar face here to us at KVU, who has helped us understand complex legal issues as well. So I want to just start by saying what people are saying to me who are watching and listening to these opening statements is that in a criminal trial, they are not accustomed, they say, to seeing so much evidence against a defendant. Thomas, what did you think about what the prosecution was bringing forward in terms of the volume of evidence against Caitlin Armstrong? It was impressive, um, and especially the right out the gate, starting with the emotional grab. Uh, you know, right out the gate, the prosecutor started with you know, the emotional pitch of what you know, the victim heard uh, and screamed. Uh, the, her, in her last moments, um, and the shots fired, uh, and then laid into what was really impressive was the amount of digital evidence uh, against the defendants. That we and James, we're talking about, when we talk about the digital evidence, we're talking about uh, cell phone information. We're talking about messages that they say Caitlin Armstrong had right. access to between Colin Strickland, Caitlin Armstrong's boyfriend, and Mariah Wilson. And one thing that I thought was so striking is that there is now this allegation that the way Caitlin Armstrong knew where exactly Mariah Wilson was was because she was monitoring the messages between the two of them. Yeah, kind of like following a location of a friend or find my friends. That's what I thought of uh, sitting in the courtroom this morning uh, is that her location was available to be tracked, unfortunately. Um, and so, you know, and not only do we see the cell phone messages and the cell phone tracking of the GPS, but then we also saw that uh, you know, we, well, what was presented in the opening statement is that um, the defendant turned off her phone from 7.30 until 9.55 or so after the murder, uh, but that even then with her phone off, her Jeep was tracking where she was. So that was an interesting twist of electronic tracking to me. Yeah, Thomas, this is an under, it really does underscore no matter where we are or what we're doing, there are cameras on us. We are leaving a digital footprint everywhere we go. And so it's very difficult to conceal a crime. You know, as a former NSA intelligence analyst, I can definitely attest to that. Um, metadata is created everywhere you go. Um, and most people don't realize just how much data you leave behind. Um, you know, we live in a digital age. And they call it a digital footprint for a reason. Correct. And when we, when we think about, as James mentioned, the fact that, that her Jeep was monitoring her, her whereabouts too. I mean, th that combined with DNA evidence, that was also brought into this picture. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of evidence, really. Correct, and it's, it's overwhelming. Um, and the prosecutor did a really good job of hammering that over and over and over again. The, the jury got a really good impression that the amount of digital evidence is a mountain against the defendant. It's not just a couple pieces here or there. It's a lot, and it's all consistent, and it all points in one direction. And James, some of that we knew. It has, had been in the public domain. So for example, the images of Caitlin Armstrong's Jeep sort of stalk, stalking, the, stalking the area. There is now uh, what we had previously known about ballistic information that linked a gun that was found in Caitlin Armstrong's house with shell casings found at, at the murder scene of Mariah Wilson. But I thought it was interesting that prosecutors also brought forth information that we didn't know. So for example, the DNA evidence that Caitlin Armstrong, they say, left behind on a bicycle found at the scene. How, how striking and important did you find that? I found that this is all going to be so important because you heard in the objections by the prosecutor today that they're just laying out a roadmap of the evidence. You know, you heard that in his, his objection to the opening statement by the defendant. So this is merely a roadmap of the evidence he's going to bring forward, meaning there's going to be a lot more of it 
uh, as we see it play out in the evidence portion of the trial. This was only a snapshot. Right. This is just a preview of what you're going to see. And I think that in the first two witnesses today, we saw that the, the state is going to go over every detail <coughs> with a very fine tooth comb. Even though there might be uh, a heavy presumption of guilt in this case in the public and in the courtroom, uh, the state made it clear that they are going to prove this case with a very thorough, thorough trial. Thomas, uh, when the defense attorney, uh, Joffrey Purrier, stood up to deliver his opening statements, I thought that was an important moment because uh, there has been so much information about Caitlin Armstrong and allegations against Caitlin Armstrong in the public sphere. I think the question going into this was, well, what's her defense? Right. What did you think about, about Joffrey Purrier's opening statement from the defense side? Well, it's tough, and he's in a tough position, but you know, it's really important to do what he did, which was to remind the jurors that she is presumed innocent, right? And that's, that's the level set. Uh, and to start there and to remind them that it is the state's burden to prove that she's guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And to remind people that beyond a reasonable doubt is a very high standard, right? Now, all he can really do at this point is to poke holes. Right. He has to, he's a very good attorney, but he doesn't really have a whole lot of cards to play. All he can really do at this point is try to poke holes. I don't envy him. So if you are defending her as, as a defense attorney, this is what you do, Thomas. So if this case lands, lands on your desk, what are those holes? One of the holes that I thought he did a good job picking up on was the ballistics, right? Um, you know, that, that area has come under real scrutiny in recent years as, as not a real science. Um, and I thought that was fair to hit on that. Um, but, you know, you notice that he, he didn't want to touch a lot of the digital, you know, evidence. Yeah, it's circumstantial, but there's a mountain of it. And how do you explain all that away? And also, didn't really touch on the recent jail escape. Uh, now, pre-trial, the defense brought a motion to try to keep all that out. Uh, it didn't work. Uh, and more importantly, what you'll also notice is usually in a case, uh, we don't let the jury know that the defendant is in custody because it biases the jury. In this case, that's out the window. Mm -hmm. There was no pretense to that. Obviously, it was disclosed and she just tried to escape from jail and she was surrounded by six deputies. So there was no pretense that she was in custody. James, at one point, Joffrey Purry, your Caitlin Armstrong defense uh, team member, said that she's in a nightmare of circumstantial evidence. How do you think that landed? First of all, what did you think about him saying that? And, and framing it that way. And how do you think that landed with this jury? I, I feel the same way that Thomas <laughs> just expressed that um, no, one, no attorney is envying Joffrey's position in this case right now. Uh, I thought that there was a, uh, you know, a noticeable lack of any evidence on her favor. And so when, uh, when her attorney presented that she's in this nightmare of circumstantial evidence, he also mentioned that she was an already troubled person and I think that he also mentioned um, that she uh, enjoyed last minute travel, you know, as it relates to her. Yeah, to I was going to, I was going to ask you both about, right. about that assertion. Yeah. And so some of those <laughs> comments uh, in bulk led me to think that if, if we're not going for absolute not guilty, we might be looking for some leniency. And so that's how I interpreted those comments. But it sounds like you both are in agreement that the, the, the defense is thin in this case. It is. Yeah. You know, I, I thought in observing the, the presentation of the state and then the defense, I thought that the defense might make a stronger presentation. Uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, Joffrey is an excellent speaker. He's an excellent trial lawyer. Um, former just, judge. Former judge. Uh, plenty of experience in this field. Uh, and I think that he just didn't have a lot to work with. And so that makes it really hard on him. Thomas, I noticed that he did address head-on, I suppose, her, her travel 
to Costa Rica. Yeah. Um, he made no kind of, uh, he didn't dance around that. He addressed it in his opening statements, but framed it very differently from a flight from custody. According to him, that Caitlin Armstrong loved worldwide travel. She loved to travel to destinations uh, where yoga was popular. As we know, Caitlin Armstrong was a, was a yoga instructor at, at different points. What do you think about him addressing that in this sort of direct way and maybe more importantly, what he said about it? Well, he absolutely had to. He had to say something, right? Because otherwise it's the elephant <clears throat> in the room, right? But the problem is, is that, yeah, you, you, you address it, but there's another elephant hanging in the room is, what about the plastic surgery, mm -hmm. right? Um, that doesn't explain why you would go to Costa Rica and get plastic surgery and then hide. And, and just about, what, a week before Caitlin Armstrong was apprehended by federal officials, according to prosecutors, she had $6,000 uh, in plastic surgery done on, on, a nose, on her nose, a nose job. In addition, the entire time, digital evidence again, she's constantly Googling herself, looking for warrants on herself. Again, it goes to guilty mind. We, we heard from, from a series of witnesses that the state uh, put on this afternoon as well. I want to talk about a couple of those. Of course, there was, was Matt Wilson, Mariah Wilson's brother, who took the stand to talk about his love of his sister and, and I think the state's effort to really paint a portrait of who Mariah Wilson was. But then the second witness was Caitlin Collins, who is an Austin woman who who Caitlin uh, who Cash. Mariah Wilson was Caitlin Cash, excuse me, uh, who Mariah Wilson was staying with, and and during her testimony, the 911 call of of her calling uh, for help when she discovered Mariah Wilson's body was was played, and and I think the only way to really describe that is, is very wrenching. Thomas, what was your reaction to, to that and the state putting forward that evidence early in the trial? Smart by the prosecutors, right? Um, you know, when you're, ultimately it's about telling a story, right? And, and when you tell a story, especially to the jury and you're trying to convict, you want to make this real, right? You don't want to make this abstract. You want to make this person real and you want to tell just how gut-wrenching gut -wrenching this was and you want to pull them in um, and you want to get them emotionally to buy in. And that was a good way to do that right off the bat. Caitlin Cash was sobbing on the stand. You could hear, I know we were, all three of us were sitting in the courtroom, you could audibly hear people, people sobbing. Um, James, what was your reaction to, to that uh, particular piece of evidence? It, it, I will say the same. It was very wrenching to hear it. I was really impressed by how composed Miss, Miss Cash was, even in that horrific scene. She's on the phone trying to do CPR, following directions. She remains with her friend who she's describing as covered in blood. That's a horrific scene, and she didn't know what happened. So, you know, for all we know, we don't know if, if she was in danger at that time. Uh, so watching that um, was both very hard on me and hard on the witness, but what I looked to was I looked to see how the jury reacted to it. Because, uh, as it's been mentioned, and we can all agree, the, the most important group here is the jury who's right. going to decide the outcome. When the 911 call was played, uh, I noticed jurors in the front row um, visibly you know, discomforted. Yep. And so I took that as a, as a bad sign for this defendant. A defense attorney, that is not what you want to see right. in, the, in no. the very, very, this early in the, in the case. I mean, they were grabbing tissues. Which is, a, which is a reminder, a very important reminder, that despite all of the salaciousness surrounding this case, at the center of it is, is a young woman whose life was lost, who was a bright star and, and by every account had, had a bright future ahead of her. Absolutely. We also noticed today that um, after the first witness, Mo's brother, mm -hmm. uh, there were quite a, a few family members, yes. including Mo's parents in the room. Right. And we noticed that uh, at the close of her brother's testimony, most of the family exited in a big group and left the trial. Yeah. And it's probably a good thing they did before the testimony of Ms. Cash, which was so graphic and played right. the 911 call. I don't think this family needs to relive that again. Thomas, I wanted to ask you, because I thought James made a, an 
important point that I had not thought of, and that is, is the question so much guilt innocence here, or is her defense team, Caitlin Armstrong's defense team, already moving toward an idea of leniency? Not, not whether or not she goes to prison, but how much time she receives. Right. I would, I would reframe the question a little bit, right? It's, it's not guilt or innocence, it's, a, it's reasonable doubt, right? If yeah. you can find any area of reasonable doubt that you can poke, right? And it just takes one. It just takes one. Um, and then, you know, also, you know, while you're at it, try to put some leniency along the way, right? What the what the defense did right off the bat was to, to you know to his point was to inject a little bit of hey she's troubled right who amongst us doesn't have some issues and they they injected that right from the beginning and that's always a fine line to dance because you know you don't want to admit your client's guilty but you also want to put some mitigation in there while you're at it. Thomas Just, James Wood, thank you both so much for, for sharing your expertise with us, and we very well may call on you again as this case goes forward. This case is expected to last a couple of weeks. It is happening in the largest courtroom in the Travis County Criminal Courthouse. There, was a, there were no empty seats this morning, I think really underscoring just how closely this trial is being watched, not just here in Austin, but in the cycling community worldwide. Thank you again both so much Thanks, for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us, and we'll continue to follow this case closely in the days to come.